Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the uh, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology at the University of Ottawa. And in this video, I'll be discussing declining oxygen levels in the atmosphere. So the Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago, 4.57 to be exact. The atmosphere had hydrogen and helium and ammonia and methane in it mostly, a little bit of nitrogen. And then as time proceeded, the water vapor built up and declined, carbon dioxide built up and declined. Life uh, started forming and the oxygen was being produced and absorbed, so it was very, very low levels. And finally, after things were oxidized on the surface, the oxygen level started building up in the atmosphere. So I'll discuss a bit more about the history of the oxygen and then get into what's happening today. So how did life uh, start on the planet to start generating the oxygen? Well, in the 50s, this guy Miller approached Ure and wanted to do his PhD um, on trying to generate life and Ure was very skeptical at first said you know yeah right uh, gonna generate life so anyway he accepted him and this is the experiment that was done they had a uh, glass cylinder here a glass uh, sphere rather they put in what they thought was in the atmosphere billions of years ago before life was there H2O water methane ammonia hydrogen carbon monoxide, no oxygen at all. And then they uh, generated an electric spark in the sphere to simulate lightning. And uh, it reacted, the, the, it did things to these chemicals, broke them apart. They went back a week later and they found amino acids had appeared in the sphere. Now amino acids are the building block of proteins, which are the building blocks of life. So this was a very significant experiment, the Ure Miller experiment, and uh, so he did get his PhD from it. The, it, was, it was accepted. Um, it, was, it was a very, very significant experiment. Um, it may not be the, the way life formed on Earth. It may have, you know, another theory is from comets. The amino acids arrived on Earth from the tails of comets. We've measured amino acids in the tails of comets. Another idea is that um, a uh, supervolcano covered the ocean with uh, the pumice, a very light and thin rock with lots of holes in it, lots of little compartments, and those compartments could be like miniature test tubes and chemicals in there could mix. You could have a billion, you know, gazillions of experiments going on there sort of thing simulated, and maybe one of them uh, generated life. You know, there's different theories, uh, but that's not the point of this talk. So let's look at oxygen. So basically no oxygen till about 2.5 billion years ago, then it started rising to the few percent level, about 3% or so, to 0.85 billion years ago. Then there was a sharp rise, it went all the way up over to about 35% or so, dropped back down to about 15, rose again, and it's at 21% here today, um, or the present level. So what's the reason for all that fluctuation? Okay, well, this is a more detailed view in the last billion years, you know, where it was at 3% or so, and then a rise up to, like I said, 35%, then back down to below 15, about 13 or so, back up to 30, and then to 21 where we are today. So this is a period called the Carboniferous period. It was 35%. Imagine lightning strike then, everything would burn, right? With that much oxygen level, oxygen in the atmosphere, um, everything would burn. Remember Apollo 1, they, they had 100% oxygen in the capsule and it was just being tested, a spark went off, everything incinerated. So things burn very, very quickly when the oxygen levels are that high. Um, but also some interesting things happened. Animals were able to um, spend a lot less energy on, on, um, on metabolism because they got more oxygen from each breath, there was more in the air, so they could get much bigger, much stronger, uh, and things. So this is an example here. Um, this is a Meganeura, a dragonfly from the Carboniferous when the oxygen was 35%. So this thing had a wingspan of 65 centimeters, so 2.1 feet. So imagine a dra dragonfly, you know, from today to, you know, the Carboniferous. So take everything today and ex multiply it up in size, you know, and animals could be like that because of the large oxygen level. So this is interesting, right? We're about 400 parts per million. The North Pole mean annual temperature is minus 20 degrees Celsius or so. 
Okay, when the CO2 concentration was 2,000 ppm, okay, five times higher, that was 55 million years ago during the paleo, Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, the PETM for short, the North Pole's temperature averaged 23 degrees Celsius or 73.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, this is the average temperature at the North Pole. Obviously, we're talking about a planet with no snow and ice in the north. And this is, this is the direction that we're heading to. We're rapidly losing sea ice, snow cover, the feedbacks kick in, we get methane burps coming up, we get an equalization of temperature with latitude, we lose all the snow and ice and the coldness in the Arctic. You know, this is the, you're going through an abrupt period, uh, abrupt climate change if this happens very quickly. Uh, which I would argue, you know, this is where we're, where we're this is where we're heading at rapid speeds right now. So I just wanted to throw that in, you know, to think about. Okay, um, so what are some of the reasons for the the oxygen increase? Okay, so here we had biological carbon fixation. So we think there was life at this time, very primitive life, but the oxygen level was still very low because whatever oxygen was was produced by the plant matter, very primitive plant matter, would actually be absorbed in the rocks and minerals and so on and so forth. Um, you know, of course, the further back we go, the, the, the more we're speculating, the less, the less we know for sure. Uh, cyanobacteria appeared here, you know, and there was enough oxygen, so a lot of the surface of the earth was oxidated, oxidized, so we could start getting oxygen in the atmosphere. This is the atmospheric level. So it could start to rise, and then we got, uh, these, these are, these, this, this is primitive life without a nucleus, um, and then algae here. Now look at the growth spurts here. You know, there's upticks here, upticks here, upticks here. You know, this is probably related to continental drift, right? As you get an, o you know, the continents are always drifting, but as you get a new ocean forming, you know, as you get a split or something, then you get a lot more soils and therefore a lot more nutrients put into the ocean and those nutrients stimulate phytoplankton growth and other plant growth and produce could produce a surge of oxygen in these periods. Um, you know, so a lot of oxygen sinks here, oxidation of volcanic gases, of terrestrial minerals, um, you know, uh, diagen diagenesis, I'd have to look that up again, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, oxygen sources, photosynthesis here, perhaps alternate metabolisms. So oxygen has changed a lot. Um, what's happening today? Okay, CO2 levels rising rapidly. Um, this is oxygen levels. So oxygen levels are falling. This, the blue curve is atmospheric oxygen in, uh, okay, the, the pink curve is in alert and uh, the Cape Grim, Australia is the, is the uh, reddish or cyan curve. Okay, so one in the north hem northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere, they're both decreasing. The decrease is about roughly, um, you know, it's going from minus 100, slightly higher to minus, so it's about minus 300, minus 400. This is basically PPM of oxygen decline, while the CO2 level has gone up from about 350 to about 380. So, so the CO2 level has gone up about 30 ppm and the oxygen has dropped uh, 3 to 400 uh, ppm. So what does that mean? Um, is the oxygen dropped just from combustion or is it from other things as well? So this is some comments on this paper you know, the, ox the oxygen declined three to 400 ppm. Now the oxygen, 21%, air is 21% oxygen, so that's about 210,000 ppm. Okay, so if you take away 300 to 400 from, take away 400 more like from 210,000 ppm, that's a drop of 0.2%. So we've had a decline of about 0.2%, um, and that would just be, from, that would be the decline from, let me go back here, from 1991 or so to 2004. So this is old data. These are some more recent data. Um, this is from a very interesting paper 
um, in 2010, an, a skeptical science article um, by John Cook, actually. Um, so, okay, so let me uh, see what's happened. I've lost my place. There we go. Okay, so that was this one here. Okay, so moving on. There we go. Okay, so this is just another place. This is Bear, Alaska. CO2 going up, oxygen going down. The oxygen going down is about a 10 times faster rate than the CO2 going up. So um, you could argue that uh, you know some of it is because of combustion, but a lot is because of the deforestation and loss of plankton in the oceans. I think the loss of plankton in the oceans is the largest effect by far. So that's Bear, Alaska. And this is, uh, so this is um, basically, this is interesting. Um, if you, the seasonal oxygen oscillations are about 0.003% or 30 ppm um, from a background of 20.946%. So this is showing you the effect of the boreal forest alone because the, the deciduous trees in the Northern hemisphere are gaining leaves and losing leaves depending on the season, absorbing more or less carbon, and therefore having affecting the O2 level. Okay, um, now, so I'm, I'm, this is another way of looking at it. Um, this is Scripps uh, data. Um, basically, it's showing that we're losing about 19 O2 molecules per year out of every 1 million O2 molecules in the atmosphere. So that's the 19 uh, parts per million each year. So let's have a look at some more data here. Uh, here we go. So if I go to the Scripps Atmospheric Ocean Research Program, um, then I can get data. So this is Alert Canada. This is the rise in CO2, you know, curving upwards exponentially and the drop in oxygen curving down exponentially. And the uh, rate of change, you know, if you look at the rate here, you know, this is going up about 50, this is going down about 500. So it's a factor of 10 times faster in terms of uh, re relative to the, in, in, if you put it in PPM values. This is at uh, Mauna Loa, the same sort of thing, less seasonal fluctuation. And this is in, in, in the Antarctica. Almost no CO2 fluctuation on a seasonal basis and still lots of oxygen. But the declines are about that 10 to one ratio. So, if, so every PPM of CO2 rise, we get uh, 10 PPM of oxygen rise. But the oxygen level is 21%, so do we need to worry about it? You know, of course, oxygen is vital, okay? You know, we all animals breathe oxygen, breathe out CO2, and plants are the opposite. So if we uh, continue to reduce plant biomass, and we reduced it about 50% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, if we continue to do that, we're going to severely mess up the atmosphere. So what does all this mean? Okay. Um, Patrick McNulty reminded me of the uh, sort of comparison of present day climate change to the Apollo 13 mission. So in the Apollo 13 mission, you've probably seen the movie. These are the, the original three guys, Fred Hayes, Swigert, J Jack Swigert, and Jim Lovell. This guy doesn't look like Tom Hanks, right? They should stick Tom Hanks in there. So this is what the guy actually looked like. Um, and uh, they lost their oxygen tank. And uh, they, the, the ship, they lost their power. So what they, it's interesting. You know that saying, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Where is it? Uh, Houston, we have a problem. This is from the movie in 1995. Houston, we have a problem. In reality, the statement was, Houston, we've had a problem. I didn't know that, interesting. But anyway, they had to improvise. They had to. They had a problem with buildup of CO2 in the spacecraft, so they had to. They they had filters that were round holes instead of square. They had to improvise. They had to geoengineering and affect the atmosphere of the spacecraft. So we may have to do the same thing for the planet, which is what I'm arguing. And I think I'm out of time. So uh, thank you for your attention.